GFL is college for whom? Well, A for college for whom? Yeah. And originally it was independents, but later on, conservative Democrats and, and almost all Republicans oppose it. It goes against trickle-down economics. That's why it's my favorite. Southern Democrats, you know, remember Jim Crow and all that. But we'll get to more on that in a second. Remember Roosevelt wanted, at least one of the goals of it would be the third new deal would be would be massive aid, aid for public education, including, including tuition for college, which of course did not happen. We'll talk about that again. And where did the Soviets blockade? Uh, yeah, Berlin. And because the Britain, the British, the US, and the French made what for their occupation zones at common what? Currency. Yeah, currency. And what country was created? Yeah, with the capital of a little tiny town called Bonn, which is now like a big ghost town with these massive government buildings. The whole idea was they could move it to Berlin. So they wanted to make it put it in a really small town so there wouldn't be a big cry to keep it there if Germany did reunify or when it did. Just no one could win. And oh, because of the National Security Act. First off, it meant that the give the president what kind of powers to do without asking Congress. Yeah. Which of course would happen time after time. And the government now can act under a veil of what? What were the two spy agencies created? Yeah. NSA, yeah. So let's go ahead and get to we got post war, we got this. Oh, what was the conference that set up a monetary system that will last in the 70s? Say it again. Yeah, what was the name of it? Yeah, Bretton Woods. Yep. So you love this one? All every radio station had to get the microphone. So they had a separate microphone going to their own feed. Basically through the phone is how they would do it then. And I love that. So there's one microphone. So you might see one just like a hundred microphones. I think I have one picture of that. It's really kind of fun. And so they changed how to do it. But a couple of things about this. Just like World War One, there is going to be a post-war depression. Just like World War I, there'll be inflation, but unlike World War I, it won't be double the prices. If prices will go up, especially as they switch from making weapons to consumer goods, but the economy was better. And so the shock was not like 1920 to 21, which would affect the whole decade and help lead to the Great Depression in many ways. This, the United States was much better off. They did a better job in World War II planning for the future. But I already mentioned this once before. Republicans were swept in in 46, tired of Democrats. But a lot of Republicans, when they came in and took control of the House and the Senate, they're thinking we could finally get rid of what was FDR's program called? Get rid of the New Deal. They were intensely anti-New Deal, and many of them thought they could weaken or get rid of things like Social Security, also like the Fair Labor Standards Act, which are things like you know, minimum wage, 40 hour work week, get rid of those. They violate trickle down economics. And those who believe in conservative economics to this day have wanted to get rid of those. But they were intensely popular. People liked the 40 hour work week that just started and the benefits that came with that. And not only that, they loved the Social Security. And farmers liked the farm program then that would be in place of 73. But they could peck away at the Wagner Act. Remember the Wagner Act, the law for labor unions. A law is actually called an amendment to the Fair Labor Standards Act, but we're just going to call, everyone calls it the Taft-Hartley Bill after the two co-sponsors. The Taft-Hartley Act was an intensely anti-union law. Truman would veto it, but conservative Democrats joined Republicans and overrode the veto. And it would make it much harder to form unions, and union strength would begin to go down, but it really wouldn't be noticed in the 1980s. Where membership in labor unions and a changing economy of the 80s, membership just tanked. So it would go from just about 40% at the beginning of the 1970s to left well less than 10, I think it's 8% now, and still dropping, with a corresponding drop in wages. They also took away one of the biggest weapons that labor unions have. It's violated. Do you remember in Flint, Michigan, 36, 37, where workers at General Motors strike? What kind of strike was that? Do you remember? Yeah, those sit-down strikes, those are now illegal, along with boycotts and things like that, to make it harder for unions to organize. Democratic presidents 
all the way up to the late 1970s, the Democratic candidates said, we're going to repeal Taft-Arlen. And then as the Democratic Party became increasingly more conservative, that was abandoned. And so the last couple Democratic presidents were pretty economically conservative, Clinton and Obama, and they didn't touch that. But this is now actually kind of an issue in the Democratic primary right now. So it's kind of fascinating how that has come back a little bit. And you know how many people are running for, pre for the Democratic nomination of president right now? Anywhere from three to 4,000. And it's like, hmm. You may know. There's 16 announced. Yeah, it, I, it, the Republicans went at 15 in 2016. And they joked around like a clown car. You know, you clown car and open his door and like 100 people come out. That's what it's going to appear like when the Democrats do it too. And even though this, right, there's a couple clear front runners, and who knows? But we'll see. And so with that, one thing about this though, Republicans then were very confident that in the election of 1948, they could win a big victory. And this is maybe one of the most exciting elections in American history. And it was the last one before TV. Television was literally just starting, but was not near nationwide. The Democrats reluctantly nominated Harry Truman. And actually, Truman didn't want to be president. He didn't like being president. And when the war ended, he was popular. And then by 47, he was unpopular. He hated it. But he called his program, gee, I wonder where he got that name, the Fair Deal. So we had the Square Deal. Who did the Square Deal? What president? Teddy? The New Deal? <laughs> Franklin, and then... And this would finish it. And actually, Truman was reluctant to do this. He would get the nomination, but he actually offered it to the commander of all Allied forces. And soon he would command, what was the military alliance here? NATO. NATO. What did the Russians counter it with? What's military what alliance? So. The commander here of Allied forces, then the first commander of NATO was what man? You want to know? Someone, someone said Eisenhower. MacArthur was in Japan. Dwight Eisenhower. Eisenhower was actually, he said, you wanted to have, Truman asked him, do you want the Democratic nomination? It's yours. Not only did Eisenhower turn it down, he really didn't even know what party he was in and didn't really vote. Why is that ironic? Yeah, he'd be the next president after Truman. He would decide in 52, I'm a liberal Democrat. I mean, a liberal Republican. I'm a liberal Republican. And once he decided he was that, once he had announced he was going to run, there was no way he was going to stop him. He was not popular. But, Remember what I told you, there were conservative Democrats and liberal Democrats, there were conservative Republicans and liberal Republicans. It's a lot different than today. I mean, there's still a lot of conservative Democrats, but there's virtually no liberal Republicans. And so, the fair deal, and these are the issues of the fair deal. First off, just like what FDR won, education. He wanted tuition paid for. He wanted massive aid for public schools. Basically, the GI Bill, they looked at we do the GI Bill for everybody. That's what they said. So this is like what Roosevelt wanted until court packing and the Roosevelt recession they destroyed it for him. Second part, just like Roosevelt, national health care insurance. It would be through the Social Security Act or through the Social Security system. They would collect taxes that way and pay for everybody's insurance because it was clear that health care was going to be significantly more expensive than most people could afford. Because the thing is, healthcare is like relatively cheap when you don't need it, and then all of a sudden it becomes shockingly expensive. If you don't believe me, look at a bill how much it is to stay in one hospital one night in the US. I mean, we're talking many thousands of dollars. In fact, they charge it like $500 for a day. So, I'm actually not kidding. The bills are pretty amazing. That's monopolies. But, and it would probably be something like, in 1965, we get a little version of this. Health care, health, the government would provide health insurance for the elderly. What is that called now? Say it again? Yeah, Medicare. So in 65 and older, we'll get health insurance through the government. And that's kind of what he wanted, um, but it's a little bit slightly different. That is going to be a major issue in the 2020 election. Everybody should have that kind of insurance. And lastly, 
He wanted to end Jim Crow laws and the restrictions on voting, civil rights, equal rights for all Americans. Now, one step at a time. And he had already done that year by executive order, angering Southern Democrats. He, we got to get this down, he segregated the military. The president has that authority. So he, he overturned the segregation of the military that is on having, back in the Civil War, remember I told you, about colored units back in 1863 after the Emancipation Proclamation. And this is the newspaper. This was incredibly radical. In fact, Truman, they pushed him as vice president in 44. They pushed him on Roosevelt to replace his other one. Because Southern Democrats thought Truman, as someone from Missouri, would not push for civil rights in case Roosevelt did pass away or kind of resisted after the war, Roosevelt was still president. And he would be the one pushing for it. They immediately called him a traitor to a section. There's an irony to this. The president who's, who um, would sign the bills and push harder than any other least politician for civil rights would be a Texas. Always looks at you. Look! Danny DeVito. LBJ for the USA. And so, Danny DeVito is actually very political, but that's another story. So, with that, that's actually true. And it worked. A lot of a lot of people in the military said, it wants you allow blacks in these same units as whites, whites won't want to fight. Effectiveness will drop, morale will drop, and there were actually a lot of Southerners in the Army who resisted this a lot, Southern whites, but not only did it, they proved it wrong, but the Army actually became much more effective, and it showed that, yeah, we can order people to do this, and it will work, and then it becomes normal. Similar thing happened on the same statements nine years ago when allowing homosexuals into the military, almost the same arguments, 48 and 2010. But this issue, Truman would not back down. And they told him, Southern Democrats will leave. And Southern Democrats have done it before. 1860, Stephen Douglas was going to get the nomination, and Southern Democrats formed their own party. Do you remember that? In fact, they nominated somebody. Remember who they nominated? No one remembers? John C. Breckenridge. And Breckenridge, I <laughs> haven't done that for a while. It felt good. It's back in the saddle. So, and that allowed what person to win because of the split Democratic Party? What person would win? Not 1860. Yeah, Lincoln. Not, yes, it was a long time ago. Unfortunately, since you don't remember, that will be a good thing to do another practice essay and brainstorm this on the events leading up to the Civil War. That's how I got to that. You want to hear what I said on for Tuesday? The fiery 15th of the United States of the Civil War. It's good review. Did you take, by the way, when you went through a review for the Industrial Revolution, did you go back through and look at your review packet while you did it? If you did not take that opportunity, you blew it on a good opportunity to go back and tie these together and review for the exam. Because you're going to have to read, you have to do it anyways. And that give you an idea to, or that give you a, a, a chance to tie things together. Okay, so back to this. Well, did anybody put down things like transcendentalism or the Second Great Awakening? Oh, great. I forgot to mention that. that was a great effect of that. And if you didn't remember that, hopefully not at all. I remember that was a key important event. So, Southern, and Southerners were furious, and this would split the Democratic Party. They walked out, and Truman would not back down on the civil rights plan. This rather creepy cartoon, I don't know who he's talking to, but he said he will stand pat. He's not going to quit on civil rights. He will not back down. And then it says, you'd rather be right than president. Because with the Democratic Party split, the Republicans now have a great opportunity. And they would split. They would go form their own convention. And in fact, here they are walking out. And they're carrying their state banners with them. And the new party, 
the state rights party. And states right now, this was only for one election. And states rights, everybody knew states rights was code for segregation. Just like states rights before the Civil War was code for pro slavery. It's not that they, they only care about states' rights if you allow them to keep Jim Crow. And they also called themselves the Dixocrats. You might remember that name. That's what they called Southern Democrats who were pro Confederates right up to the Civil War during presidential reconstruction. Taking Dixie for the South and Kratz for the Democrats. Dixiecrats, but technically the states' rights. They nominated the segregationist governor of South Carolina, Strom Thurmond. So there's Thurmond on the left. And you notice they say they're fighting for liberty. That's you see the uh, Statue of Liberty, but it's the liberty to have segregation. And this, the Confederate battle flag, made the reappearance for the 1920s. 20s are kind of was brought out by the Klan. That was looking for white supremacy. But everybody knew what the Confederate battle flag meant right here. Jim Crow laws, segregation. Everybody knew, and the. The flag went all over. In fact, in South Carolina, which had the first real state flag, and a pretty cool flag they saw it today, they didn't want to change that flag. So they would start flying the Confederate battle flag on the roof, on the top of the rotunda of their state capitol. And like Tennessee would change their state flag to make it look more like the Confederate battle flag, which it is right now. And that became a sign for them. So these appeared all over. And if there's any question what they stood for, here is a quote by Strom Thurmond in 1948. Now, let's be clear about it. They're talking about African Americans there, but it means anybody who's not white. But the big thing for the South was. And Negro was used all the time for blacks. That was actually seen as the, the correct name up until the late 1960s and the 70s. And but you know that's kind of a kind of combination of Southern accent and a way to kind of say something else. And so you see a lot of Southern politicians do this. And I thought this a couple good things about it. First off, you know, it's the Confederate flags at the convention with the American flag and the picture of Robert E. Lee. <laughs> so going back to the Confederacy without a doubt. And these are the other candidates. I love it says, "Booey, <laughs> booey." All right. So, but then the Democrats weren't done splitting. Progressives split away, like Roosevelt did with the Bull Moose Party. Remember, 1912, allowing Woodrow Wilson to win. And the former vice president, Henry Wallace, the man who was pushed out by Southerners in 1944 as vice president for Truman, he would run. And for the most part, they liked the fair deal, but they thought the Cold War was going too far. What was the doctrine? The Truman Doctrine was going to lead to World War III. And if the Soviets get nuclear weapons, the Soviets are like 15 years away, so we're fine. That's what we call foreshadowing. But if it's nuclear weapons, that could be the end of the world. And so Wallace would run to push for more equal rights, expanding the New Deal even more. Equal rights for men, for all men and women. And so Wallace was fairly radical. In fact, he campaigned in the South. But this shows Truman trying to, try to take the Democratic Party. It's Thurman on one side and Wallace on the other. The Republicans just have to show up. And it looked like he might win anywhere from 10 to 15 percent of the vote. But of course, a vote for him or a vote for Thurman is a will help what party. Now all the Republicans had to do is run somebody who will not screw up a bond. And they picked the governor of New York, Thomas Dewey. He was a very liberal Republican. So we believed in a lot of parts of the New Deal, not all. And it was not very much pro civil rights. Well, it's kind of, the Republican Party is really complex at this time. And like the Democratic Party was clearly. There's a lot of complexities here. Huh? Conservative Republicans were furious. They thought they'd get their man. <coughs> William Howard Taft's son, the guy from Taft Hartley, Robert Taft. But since for a number of reasons, Dewey decided that it would be wrong for him to accuse Truman of being what if he didn't red bait? 
Yeah. He said he was soft on communism. And what he said was, is that we're not going So I stopped everything to save that box. He thought Truman was not a communist. And other more conservative Republicans said, you've got to force or play the fact that Truman was soft on communism. He allowed for Yalta. We look weak in Berlin. He wouldn't do it. And so this is one of the more famous pictures of him. He was a former prosecuting attorney in New York. He went after organized crime. He got Lucky Luciani, uh, Dutch Schultz, some of the most famous gangsters of the 1930s. And he refused to do it. And so he ran a basic just go for me, we're gonna win easy. That is one of the more famous pictures of him. And there's a famous story about this. So look at his face, look how he looks. The photographer said, please smile, Mr. Governor. Mr. Governor. And he said, I am smiling. And that's as much as he could get. It doesn't look like his face is about ready to crack apart from that smile. That is a man not comfortable with smiling. He, in fact, it was called the little man of the wedding cake. But <laughs> they didn't do as many polls. They didn't do as many polls now, or then as now. So the last poll by an organization that still does polls called Gallup, they did their polls in the month for the election. And they had Dewey winning by 7% electoral or in the popular vote. But remember, that doesn't count what counts. And had him winning well over 300 votes in the electoral college. It was a blowout. Did you catch the caption of the cartoon? Everybody thought Dewey would win in a landslide. The Republicans will get the president, and even conservative Republicans who didn't trust Dewey were overjoyed. In fact, there's really only one person who believed that Truman would win the presidency. Truman knew something. He understood that People might have voted for Republicans in 46 out of frustration and, and being tired of war and depression. He understood that people liked Social Security. They liked the farm program of the second dump. Uh, hey, hey, hey. And he did an aggressive campaign. It's called the Whistle Stop Campaign. Train to town to town, give a speech at the back of the train on FDR's old train, the Ferdinand Magellan, which is a great name for a train. And so I'm thinking about, you want to buy me a train? I will name it Ferdinand Magellan for you. And people would come out. He was not good at giving a set piece speech, but this is the last campaign before television. Television is not live yet. It was not covering these things. It was too bulky, too difficult to do. And so he would give these speeches to people in every town. He went across Montana. Like something like 10,000 people came out in Butte to hear him speak. And he would give a speech. And it was more like a rabble-rousing speech, attacking his enemy, you know, finding the villain. And he made it very clear, the Republicans have done nothing when they took control of the House and the Senate, the do-nothing Congress, he called them. And if you vote for them, you're going to bring back the same thing that led to the Depression in 29. You're going to have the bankers and financiers who broke you, the malefactors of wealth. He would start getting fired up, and the crowd would start cheering. And then somebody would always yell out, sometimes planted, but they would yell out, give them hell, Harry. And he said, you send me back, and I will. And the whole place just cheered. And everyone thought, oh, you know, he's no chance, not going to work. In fact, the Chicago Tribune would print over one million copies of a newspaper with the great victory for Dewey. And yet when the election came out, not only is this maybe the greatest political upset in American history, he won pretty big. He won almost 5% of the popular vote. Look how many more electoral votes. And that is with, look how many votes for Dewey, I'm sorry, for uh, Thurman. And a lot of progressives at the last minute decided, we better vote for Truman. If we don't vote for Truman, I'll get to Dewey. But Wallace still got that many votes. That is why it's such a great upset. One of the biggest upset in history because nobody expected this. Now, you have lived through arguably the second biggest upset. 2016, virtually nobody thought Trump would win the presidency, including Trump. They didn't think so. I mean, they didn't think so. And you know, they didn't win the popular vote, but they won the Electoral College. And that is a huge upset because, frankly, 
No one expected that. But he did because of the Democratic Party split, that's why that's such a bigger offset. And but you'll see something. You notice the states that Thurman won. He only got votes in the South. Only in the South. And this shows the divide that's coming in the Democratic Party. By the way, one electorate in Tennessee just said, I will not vote for Truman. So vote for Thurman. And this is a shape of things to come. And the similar thing will happen when the Democrats begin pushing for civil rights again in 1960 and 64. And you'll see the same thing in the Deep South first. Yeah. Now, Montana used to have four. When I was your age, Montana had four. It's got a uh, population of other states grew. Montana stayed about the same. Montana's population grew. I mean, it was, it was like 950,000 in 1985, and now it's just a little bit off right now. Very small. Very small. Because it is, you know, like some of the towns are growing, but most of the towns in Montana are shrinking. So, so it's just, but it, so it's slightly growing, but places are growing at a much faster rate with the reapportionment. We can't get, we, have, we can't have less than three. <laughs> well, technically, I'm only one of the most represented states. Oh, yeah. Because, um, like, we have the most population that has three counties. We're the least representative of three of the ones of three, but we're the least representative of the ones. Yeah, because we have the biggest single one representative. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, that's my idea. But small states have an advantage of electoral college. We're overrepresented per voter than, let's say, California. Way overrepresented. But we still only have three because we're just a little tight. Big state, no people. So with that, <laughs> but there's one more thing. You'll see the beginnings of this divide. And the Republicans would soon start to court these voters against civil rights. They had a name for it. It's called the Southern Strategy. And they will begin to shift. In fact, Strom Thurmond, who will become senator from South Carolina, will be the first high-profile Democrat to abandon the Democratic Party and join the Republican Party. And would begin a wave that would grow in the 70s, become a tidal wave in the 80s, and now the South, especially, it's something like 80, 85% of white voters in the South vote Republican. Of course, Republicans are mostly whites. Yeah. Wasn't during the Civil War, the South had it? You would call it a Southern strategy as well. It just seems like a poor choice of strategy. Yeah, but they just took it as a, the Southern strategy in the Revolutionary War. Oh, okay. But yeah, they just said you have a way to court those voters. It's a combination of maybe civil rights and a few other things. Cultural resentments. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, he's having the Trump's cabinet. And so, with that, here's the headline. By the way, do you want to see a happy man? <laughs> and if you have one of these papers, wow, do you have a volume one? It's, it's presidential library, that big one. Right? It's really cool. I just think it, you know, it's just one of those things that the Tribune was so anti that Dewey elected. They printed all these papers so they could get it out first. And this would change. It. Republicans were fearing. And they literally said, the gloves are coming off. We are going to get brutal. They are going to begin red baiting. And the Cold War combined with Southern Democrats will destroy the fair deal. Southern Democrats would vote with Republicans to make sure the biggies were the civil rights. That was a squashed in the, in the Senate. But education, but especially healthcare insurance, it looked like health care was going to pass. But Southern Democrats, in mass, all voted against it. Why? I put down segregation, but to be blunt, it's to make sure blacks aren't going to be in the same hospitals as whites. It was racist. Now, you can make the argument we shouldn't have national health care insurance, or say we should have national health care insurance today. Today it's being called uh, <laughs> Medicare for all. Whatever your divide is, but that is why we don't. It's the racism in the South. And same thing with college, tuitions. Tuition, the plan, what, are you, what Truman wanted, and that probably would have passed. But racism. And so the shadow of slavery just is still over us. Now, the big thing though, what would really give the Republicans a lot of power in 1949, 
were two shots. In fact, both of them were in the second half of the year. That's a, a from a magazine. I just think that one. I thought that was funny, so I put that up in my own little. Okay, I thought it was funny. The bear grows and grows. I do think that's funny. The Soviet bear. But <laughs> the first big shock. The United States code named this Joe One, 1949. Anybody want to guess what Joe One is? Huh? Yeah. The first, the U.S. code named that as the first atomic bomb in the Soviet Union, September 1949. And the U.S. thought they were a good 10 to 15 years away, and all of a sudden they have this bomb. And you can imagine how that terrified the United States. Because everyone thought and knew the Soviets had this incredible army, even though it was starting to, to deteriorate. But this incredible army after World War II, but we have the bomb. And now we don't have the monopoly on the bomb. And this terrified people. They can see waves of Soviet bombers. It's no coincidence that within two years, we're ducking and covering in schools. And in 20 years, they're handing those things out. I had one of those. This is not from the state of New York, but I had one from Montana. I think it was Governor Babcock back then. That's a long time ago, if you remember my old. And it tells you how to build a nuclear bomb shelter in your backyard. And duck and cover with Bird the Turtle. I did duck and cover through third grade. And the bomb shelter in your backyard was you did a trench, you put a door over it and hide for two weeks. Huh? Yeah, it was insanity. But I was a little kid. I remember telling my dad, we should, build, we should take this trench just in case. My dad's in <laughs> he, he didn't want to tell me that. If there's nuclear war, Miles City will be gone. Why will we be gone? Because they'll bomb all around Great Falls and the fallout will drift west. I'm oh, sorry, east. We would be bad. Huh? What's that? I've seen hands. Yeah. All this, so it's spread all around them. So at that time, when I was when I was your age, there were 400 ICBMs out there on. So, but what made it even more scary is we knew we found out that there were actual spies at Los Alamos. We had broken the Soviet wartime code. It's code named Verona. We broke their code, and we saw the plans for what was the first bomb explosion. What did we call that? Yeah, Trinity. We saw the plans, and I have no idea why I have this picture twice. And I saw that first part, I thought, I'm going to leave it. I thought that was funny. This man right here, Klaus Fuchs. Fuchs. So please be careful spelling that name. Yes, we'll all do the joke together. But, because Klaus can be dangerous. But, but, he... We broke the Soviet code, and on there were the plans for the Trinity bomb, and it was in Klaus Fuchs' name. He was a spy at Los Alamos. He passed the information for the Trinity bomb to the Soviets, and they just engineered it and made it. He was a Bulgarian physicist who fled fascism, went to Britain. Britain farmed him out to the United States to work at Los Alamos, and he was back in Britain in 49 working on the British bomb, which they would explode the next year. And the British were very embarrassed. And they arrested him, and they, he immediately admitted they had about a 10-minute trial, and he was uh, convicted of espionage. Yeah. So where do his ties to the Soviet Union? Here we go. He left fascism and was fearful of it because, in fact, he is the most dangerous type of spy. He wasn't doing it for money. He was doing it because he was a communist, and he was convinced that Stalin was the only defense for the United, or only defense for the world. He just assumed that fascism would eventually overtake Britain in the United States. So I have to give Stalin the bomb. I know, I know, Stalin was a horrible person, but he was a true believer. You spies would do it for money. In fact, that's what Aldrich Gage were just talking about. He did it for money. He, a true believer. So we got to see him twice. He's actually almost proud of himself there. Boy, with the British embarrassed. But not only that, there was a wave of spies captured all over, most famously Ethel and Julius Rosenberg. Julius Rosenberg was working on the Manhattan Project in Los Alamos, and he was passing information on. He was a spy. He was a confirmed socialist, 
and they would both be arrested, he and his wife. His wife was almost certainly not a spy, but probably knew what he was doing. But in the just the absolute hysteria of the time, not only would they both be convicted of espionage, they'd both be condemned and both would be sent to the electric chair. The first time in peacetime history, spies would be executed. Or spies would be executed only for espionage. You know, they didn't even sabotage, they didn't, they were just spies. And she, there's no evidence at all that she was actually even giving information on. She knew that was a crime, but that should give you an idea how scary they were. This should remind you of 1865, when Mary Surratt, who owned the boarding house, where um, Lee, not just Lee Harvey Oswald, wrong assassin, James Wilkes Booth, would help plot, or would start plotting for the assassination of Lincoln. And Mary Surratt would be condemned and hanged for the assassination, even though she had nothing to do with it. Same kind of thing, just this anger, and then also the idea of well, women aren't supposed to do that, so we must really get them. So this spy hysteria, and look at them. What do they look like? Therefore, this enemy within. Remember the Truman Doctrine said that communism was an ideological threat, and therefore, we are dangerous from something in the mind. And then part two about this. The second big one, <coughs> Red China. The People's Republic of China was created. When I, all this area was called Red China. There have been a civil war since basically 1911 in China. The nationalists, which the United States supported before, during, and after the war, were led by, at first it was kind of going to be a democratic republic and it turned into a pretty club warlord, Chiang Kai-shek. And the communists under Mao Zedong. We'll finish it up tomorrow. There is no, nothing to do tomorrow, but it's not like you don't have fun stuff to do. Please don't forget that review, or that review pack. Go through it. Yes. Please. Have, oh, did anyone do the multiple choice? And we do it. How you guys do? I got. I got seven. Don't don't think about getting ninety percent right. It's good. You get over seventy percent right. You've done well. I'm not kidding. Don't worry about me. Don't worry. You're gonna miss a few. Oh, I do. That's good. And hopefully, when you went back and looked at their couple, you could say, "Okay, I could have got yeah, the ones like I bet you, there are a couple. I know that there are ones. I'll take it. I got it. I'll give it to you. You have to end with. Yeah, um, first part was just small. She can come like a bit of. Uh, it's a little like two minutes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we will just. We both set the wrong. I got it. I got you. This is a very odd map.